Okay, I guess we'll get started. Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, I'm Dave Hefner, and um, I am someone who dabbles with Selenium. Um, what I'm known, uh, what I spend my time doing now is I work on Selenium IDE, which is um, probably why you're here. Um, so uh, the best place I think to start is um, maybe some context as to why I'm talking about record and playback when I'm uh, someone who used to be very much anti-record and playback and why am I working full time um, helping to develop Selenium IDE. Um, so I'd like to take you back 10 years ago um, when I first got started in test automation. And so I didn't have any prior experience as a programmer. Um, the most I had was probably an intro to programming course in college where I learned about arrays and, and loops and that was about the extent of my knowledge. And then I was a network engineer. That's, uh, I went to school as basically an IT operations person, and that's my profession was like server and network engineering. Um, and so um, I worked at a company that had this opportunity for me to transition into a different role. I kind of got burnt out doing IT operations, and I realized that what I needed to do was something else. And so um, I, I like to say I got tricked into doing test automation uh, because it was supposed to be like, just try this job for like a week and see if you like it. And it turned out that um, there was no going back once I made that decision. <laughs> Management didn't tell me that. Um, and so I started working as a software tester and on a team where it was the more stereotypical team where it's less technical people who don't have any prior experience with programming and they were using Selenium IDE. And so this was 2009. Um, and so with my limited understanding of programming, um, I was thrown into the deep end with test automation with other people who had no experience in test automation using a tool that was really terrible. <laughs> and so that um, helped give me um, my first impression of record and playback tools, which um, stayed with me up until recently. And, um, and something else happened in 2009. I was fortunate enough to go to a conference in Chicago, um, the annual Agile conference. And there were two people there who I got to spend some time with. One of them was Adam Goucher, who was the, um, the maintainer of Selenium IDE at that time. And the other person was Jason Huggins, the creator of Selenium. And fun fact, um, less than maybe 200 meters from where this conference was, was where the ThoughtWorks office was, which is where Selenium was created. And so it's kind of this weird, um, I don't know, nexus of the universe. But um, I got to spend some time talking to Adam and Jason and I, and based on everything that I could find online, because the information at that time was less available, less prolific, um, and not nearly as, um, as good quality as what it is now. Um, but basically, near as I could tell, we had to export the code and then wrap everything up in a framework and just figure that out, but there was no happy path. Um, and it really depended on your situation and, and your context. And I, I basically went to Jason and Adam. I said, is this right? Like, this seems really hard. <laughs> and Jason Huggins looked at me and he said, you're on the right track, kid. Keep going. It's really hard, but you'll get there. And I was like, oh, uh, OK. Um, and so that's where I started my journey with test automation and getting into programming. Um, and then since then, I've done quite a lot with test automation and programming. And I started to solve the problem that I saw in the industry, which was um, for someone in the position that I was in getting started was really difficult. Like the information wasn't available. It was really hard to figure out even like, well, I need to pro learn how to program. How do I do that? Which language do I even start with? And all, all of that. And so I've created all this content since then and, um, and consulted with companies and helped you know, do successful implementations at many places um, with test automation with Selenium. And over time, um, I never let go of that <laughs> impression of record and playback, thinking, okay, in code, this is how you do it. And if you look at current editions of a lot of my content, the only mention of Selenium IDE is how to export to code. <laughs> and so, um, but that's going to change, I think, um, at least my cursory mentions of the IDE uh, will change. Um, but I still think that if you're willing to write stuff in code, do that. Um, but the IDE, um, as I'll get to it, I think is, is um, it's, I've changed my mind on it. And so um, I want to fast forward um, a few years after uh, my, my introduction to test automation. About four or five years ago, I became the program chair of SelenumConf. And part of that role um, involves uh, 
speaker selection, talk selection. So we get hundreds, just like with this conference, you get hundreds of submissions, you have to review all of them, and you have to distill it down to just um, the best and a very short list. It's very difficult. Uh, what you get from that process year over year is exposure to what are people doing in the industry, what's new, what's the same. And um, between my consulting, between um, program selection, um, and just my own experience working as an individual contributor at companies, I realized that the problems that people have at companies are all the same. And sometimes there's new technologies, but in test automation, like our industry doesn't actually move very quickly. Um, and so if someone thinks they have a, a new way to solve the same problem, odds are someone else has already solved it. So everyone is actually really just recreating the wheel. And so um, what I thought was, I think that maybe instead of trying to say, ah, there's one perfect programming language everyone should use, here is the best framework, or here is the best model for building a framework everyone should use, um, there's an easier way to solve this problem because even if you can get everybody who builds a framework in code to follow the same patterns, um, it still alienates a huge potential user base of people who are not comfortable getting into code um, for various reasons. And so I think that's really what changed my mind was I see a huge opportunity to solve all the problems that when you spend enough time doing test automation, you know you have to solve. And you talk to other people who have done it. And you're like, oh, yeah, I, I know that problem. I solved that problem. Um, and so we could just take all of that and put that into an easy to use tool like Selenium IDE. And there was this really interesting opportunity given that um, Selenium IDE died <laughs> a painful death um, due to a huge um, shift in uh, Mozilla's um, extensions. And there was this, this huge um, renaissance of uh, effort to bring it back to life. And that's kind of where I came in after it was already happening. And so um, the way I think about it now, um, I think that just like what I'm thinking from my, my experience, the perspective that I had about recording and playback tools was w with old information, with old experiences. And um, I think a lot of people view record and playback now that same way. There's a stigma attached to record and playback tools. And the way I think about it now is it's very similar to NoSQL and serverless. These are just words, and they're often misunderstood by people. Um, but the concept being that in NoSQL, it's not only SQL. It's something that is SQL and then additional tooling that enhances and gives you more capabilities than what were there before. And then with serverless, it's this notion of you can take, uh, you, you don't have to worry about the problems of infrastructure. You don't have to solve these problems. And so the words that I would use to describe um, Selenium IDE would be, if you say record and playback, then maybe it's not only record and playback, because it is actually, we're building it as a robust IDE. Um, and, and really, the word that people throw around now is codeless. And codeless in the sense of serverless is how I look at it. Because I think you say codeless, and then programmers get all up in arms like, ah, don't take away my code. Um, and so um, I think that there's a huge um, rise of uh, codeless tools, not even just in test automation, but even in um, product development. And so there's a recent blog post from Ryan Hoover, who's the founder of Product Hunt. And he had this quote. Um, and he says, predictably, many criticize and judge those that use no-code tools. Um, while they come with trade-offs, it's inevitable that more products will be built, or at least MVP'd without writing code, including by programmers that can code. And so I posit that the same argument can be made for test automation. And we're actually seeing this within the user base of Selenium IDE right now. We have companies that have very mature implementations in code with Selenium. Um, and they're also using Selenium IDE to augment their efforts um, and do some things um, to speed up what they're working on. And so um, I think what's helpful for people, um, if, if they're paying attention and realizing, hey, these tools are actually getting really good and we should maybe pay attention to them. Um, Angie Jones recently uh, penned this blog post on 10 features every codeless test automation tool should offer. And if anything, it's just a good rubric uh, for if you're looking at more than one tool and just kind of getting a sense of what's out there, it gives you a lay of the land and helps you figure out what's crap and what's worthwhile. And so she had these 10, uh, these 10 items. She thinks a tool should have smart element locators. That's the first one. And that's probably one of the most important ones, because that's where all record and playback tools seemingly have fallen down historically. 
Um, typically, it's just brittle locators that you record the test, you play it back, and then it's broken. <laughs> or, or tomorrow it's broken, and then it's just difficult to, uh, to maintain those tests over time. And then um, conditional weighting. Um, you know, anyone that has experience using Selenium, you obviously would want to use explicit weights or an implicit weight. Um, a tool should abstract that kind of stuff away for you and give, it, give you just that stuff for free. And then um, if you want something more sophisticated in your test, you want control structures. We want to add conditional logic. You want to add looping. Um, you, want to, you want to do things that you might be able to just do in code anyway. Uh, and then the ability to add easy assertions. So not just checking to see if the text is correct or if an element is displayed, but potentially having integrations to add additional kind of assertions, like if you wanted to do visual testing or something like that. And then um, having it be a robust IDE, making sure that you can maintain your tests and modify them without having to just re-record them. Uh, one of the other things people used to talk about with um, Selenium IDE and record and playback is they call them throwaway tests. The idea that you record them and then use them until while they work, and then when they stop working, you just throw them away and then you re-record them. Um, but with a with a good enough IDE, um, in most cases, you can manage maintaining the tests without having to throw them away. And then um, some kind of abstraction, being able to reuse uh, test steps or tests. Um, most people are very familiar with page objects, and then in ven other vendor tools, there's things like object repositories. Um, but you, you need some ability to abstract commonly used um, behavior, so then uh, otherwise uh, things become very unwieldy very quickly. And then um, this is where a lot of record and playback tools start to get it wrong, um, and it's cross-browser support. Um, there's not many, at least in the free tool space, I mean, vendor tools potentially have integrations like this, but cross-browser support. So any record and playback tool should really be able to not just record the test and play it back in a browser, but be able to take those tests and then run them on any browser, just like you would if you wrote a test in code and then you want to run it on any browser. Um, you want to have good reporting, so you can diagnose why there was a failure or an error. Um, and then you want to have kind of an escape hatch. Uh, is there uh, the ability to execute um, JavaScript code or something to overcome the limitations of the current, uh, the current framework? Every tool has this. Everybody wants a JavaScript escape hatch. Um, and then continuous integration. This kind of, this to me is where it brings it all together. Um, I, I only know one tool that does this, <laughs> and it's Selenium IDE uh, so far. But the idea that um, you have all, you have um, reasonably all of these things, and you can plug them into the development workflow. Um, and so, I want to share um, uh, a few features that we have um, that I think are really important. Um, I won't cover all the top 10, but I'll cover, uh, cover most of them. Um, so if you haven't seen it yet, um, we launched a new website for Selenium IDE, and it's at this URL at the bottom. Um, so we have, uh, it doesn't look like it's from 15 years ago, <laughs> so that's a start. And uh, we actually have updated docs, and we have a whole lot of other stuff. Um, we have a whole plugins um, infrastructure, which we've documented as well, and we'll get to that um, in a little bit. Um, and also, um, Selenium IDE, sorry, I can go back if you want to get a picture of that. <laughs> yeah, Selenium IDE um, historically was only available in Firefox, but now it's built on um, web extensions. And so it's available right now in Chrome and Firefox, and there's the potential that wherever there are web extensions, um, Selenium IDE will be available there too. So, um, so the way that we handle smart locators, um, and sorry if this is a little too small for some people, but um, at the time of recording, we capture more than one locator. Um, and we're constantly trying to refine um, our heuristics for how we identify and target good locators that aren't terrible. Sometimes we still have terrible locators, but generally we have pretty good ones. Um, and so there's, there's two things that are important here. One is um, we've recently landed changes where we support data attributes. Um, so if you have a set effectively locators in your app for test hooks um, with data attributes, um, using just the standard documented data attributes, then you get that for free. When you record, Selenium IDE will find those. And then your tests are automatically amazingly reliable. Um, uh, we're we're going to be working on uh, an enhancement soon to also add the ability to add custom locator strategies. So if you use custom data attributes, you could potentially 
add those as well. And um, so what happens is we record a bunch of locators, something like five or however many we can, and um, for each action that's recorded. And then during playback, we try the highest priority one. And then if that is unsuccessful, we have an implicit weight sequence that happens that we've constructed that uh, makes sure the page is effectively stable. Um, and if, if the retry isn't successful after that timeout, then it will try all the other locators. So we have this, what we call loader, locator fallback. So we effectively try all the locators that we've recorded. And surprisingly, uh, that covers a substantial amount of ground when it comes to adding reliability to your tests in playback. <clears throat> With the exception of if your application goes through like a major overhaul, then, then there's not much you can do. But if there's like, oh, this thing moved or this locator changed, but hey, this other locator worked, like the tests aren't just gonna derail. Um, they'll, they'll still work. And um, we have information in the log that tells you, hey, these changed. Um, but w the test was able to still proceed. Um, so, so that's number one. I think that's one of, the, one of the, <laughs> the most trivial implementations that we've launched, but it's one of the ones that I think has made the hugest amount of return value for people. Um, and the other one, I think it's a lesser used feature because it hasn't been out that long, but we have this thing called the run command. And um, the run command lets you run other tests from within a test. So you can just, um, uh, actually I have a demo, this will be easier. Um, so I have this um, example for logging in and you, know, you just plug in the username, you plug in the password, and then it takes you to a page that says you're authenticated. And so I have a test. I have a test, okay. And all it does is it basically just does the same actions. It logs in, fills in the information. And the thing that's different is instead of hard coding the values, I've used variables for the username and password fields. And what I have is another test um, that sets these variable values and then calls the login test. And I have one for both valid credentials and I have one for invalid credentials. And then I go ahead and put that all in a suite called login. And now I run it and it logs in with the correct credentials for each test. And now if the login form changes for some reason, I just have to go to one place to update it. That was it, sorry, the ending transition's a little abrupt. <laughs> um, and so that's, um, so that's r the run command. That's the reusable construct we have. You know, we don't have page objects yet. We don't have any of that stuff. But again, surprisingly simple implementation that gives you like a whole heap of, uh, of value. And it's, it's clean because um, there's no shared state technically across those tests because it's all just one test. It's as if the, the login test was part of the other test. So um, there's, nothing, there's nothing like crazy going on there. Um, the next piece uh, that's interesting is control flow. So everything you're used to for programming language constructs, um, if, else, if, else, um, do, while, uh, do and then repeat if, um, and uh, we're working on adding additional control flow structures based on you know, demands from the community. So, um, but if you need to add conditional logic, uh, query the page and then based on information on the page, do certain things or conditionalize it based on like time of year or whatever, um, I don't have any great use cases for it uh, other than um, I really enjoyed building it um, and people seem to use it, so, um, but control flow. So we have the ability to make tests more robust. Um, the other thing is, given that we're an IDE, like not just we were called an IDE, so now we're living up to the name, I think that we really have an opportunity to build a robust um, integrated development environment, and so we have a debugger. And there's two things with a debugger. Um, one is, it's great because you can set a breakpoint. You can set a breakpoint, run a test, it stops at that point, and then you can inspect the page when it's in that known state. You can execute commands and you can step through the test. Um, the other bit is you can turn on um, pause on exceptions, just like what you might be familiar with with um, you know, Chrome developer tools. Uh, you run the app and the, you run your test and basically if there's an error, it'll, it'll set a breakpoint for you and then you can be in the state when the application was running and the test failed and you can start to debug and diagnose what the issue was at the time of running as opposed to trying to recreate the situation that got you there. Um, and there's, I think, I mean, all these features are nice. I think the thing, the, there's two things that really stand out for me 
um, and what is going to um, be the most useful thing for anyone that uses Selenium IDE, and it's the things I think that are unique to Selenium IDE. And the first one is um, we have the side runner. Um, we have a uh, command line runner, which we call the side runner. Side is the acronym for Selenium IDE. Um, and basically, um, it gives you cross-browser execution from the command line in parallel. Um, it's effectively, what it does under the hood is it essentially generates uh, a framework in code, uh, the same thing that you would probably write in code if you were doing this by hand. Um, and and it wraps it all up nice and neat behind a simple command line executable and then gives you runtime flags to pass in the information that you want. So if you need to run your tests against a different base URL, like a test environment, staging environment, production, you could do that. If you want to run on a grid, locally on a different browser, on Sauce Labs, on browser stack, whatever, you can do all of that through the capabilities. Um, and then you can specify how many concurrent processes you want to run, and, um, and that's pretty much it. Um, and so here is a simple example. I have a test that just does Google search. Just goes there, fills in some text, and then I search the text. And then I copied the test just for simplicity. So three of the exact same test, they're in a suite. And um, I made sure that this suite runs it with full concurrency. And then you save it to a disk. And then after that, you just go into the command line. You say Selenium side runner, pass in the capabilities you want, and then run it. And what it does is it spins up um, based on how many uh, parallel processes you need and runs them. So all three tests at the exact same time, taking a Selenium IDE project file and just running them from the command line. So that's one. The other piece I think is um, really powerful is plugins. And so plugins are really interesting to me because um, I think Anything that the IDE doesn't currently do, um, you could improve it. Um, depends on how comfortable you are with JavaScript, because <laughs> you have to you know, write some code to write a plugin. But we, uh, we make available quite a lot of information from the IDE. So you can, um, you can do a few different things with plugins. You can either customize it by, um, you can add a command, uh, modify an existing command, delete commands. You can add custom locators. Uh, you, can, you can do a whole bunch of things. Um, and the other option is, I think this is a huge opportunity, is third-party integrations. So uh, we're talking with a lot of companies who are interested in uh, making it so you can take your tests in Selenium IDE and run them in, uh, you know, like on Sauce Labs, or take your tests and run them in Apple Tools. Uh, we're talking with New Relic. You know, there's a bunch of people who are interested in potentially doing some kind of offering where you can just drop in a new plugin, drop in your API key, and then next thing you know, you have all this functionality that you didn't have before. And then also making it so it's compatible with the command line runner. So no matter what you do in IDE, making sure you could plug this into CI and have it work. And so um, the way plugins work, um, it's, uh, it's effectively all through web extensions. So you install the web extension for Selenium IDE. And then if someone else publishes another extension or uh, through the web store, like through the Chrome web store or through the Mozilla add-on store, you install that. Um, and there's also the opportunity to ins like someone to build a plugin and give it to you, and then you just install it yourself. But generally, it would be through the web store. And so um, what happens is Selenium IDE emits a bunch of events every time you run your suite. So there's things from playback. There's things from recording. Um, so things like, OK, the project loaded. OK, the suite, uh, playback of the suite has started. OK, playback of a test has started. OK, I recorded a command. And when we emit that, we also emit a payload of information, a bunch of metadata. So project name, uh, all of the, you know, all the test information, the suite information, all the commands in the test, all the tests. And with that, you can, you can start to inspect and do a lot of interesting things. And so um, a plugin would just be something you install, and then they communicate back and forth through this effective backplane of web extensions. So, um, and I think that uh, what's interesting about plugins is that anything that we aren't putting into the standard library of Selenium IDE, um, or we have plans to put into the standard library of uh, Selenium IDE, but don't have time for right now, um, plugins are a great testing ground. Um, they're really the testing ground um, to see if we can publish something quickly for the user base, or if a user submits a pull request or sends us a link to this plugin, um, people could use it. And then we can get feedback before we spend the effort to actually figure out how to properly fit it into the user experience within Selenium IDE. 
And so um, I wanted to make sure you all had something interesting and unique. So on the flight here, um, I decided to write a plugin. Uh, and so um, one thing that Selenium IDE doesn't have is the ability to do data-driven testing, right? So taking a file, like a CSV file, with like username and password information and like, or whatever, some kind of input and some expected output and like iterating through a test. And so um, I figured plugins would be a great way to, to demo this uh, and to test and see if this is something that users would want. And so um, it's something that's on a roadmap, but just something we don't have time for right now. So, but since I had time on the plane, I figured why not? Um, so I have um, the simple CSV, just um, taking the login example from earlier, there's just a username and uh, password information, and uh, made this plugin, and it's really simple. You just go, you upload a file, right, sample CSV, and then uh, you come in to, uh, to the IDE, and then it creates a variable. It, it basically makes it so this collection is available in this variable called file contents, and I've added this for each control flow structure. So you open a login page, and now when, you, when it's using the variables of username and password, it's using each variable from each row of the CSV to complete the login process. And so now when, I, now when you run the test, it steps through each of those credentials. So instead of using the run command like we are doing before, now it's just using the CSV file. And so um, it's still got some rough edges, um, <laughs> uh, but I did publish it to GitHub this morning, uh, <laughs> so if anyone wants to use it. Um, right now I don't have a, a built version, but I can, anyone that's interested come see me and we can get that sorted out. Um, and there's also, um, there's changes I had to make in Selenium IDE which haven't landed yet, so I'm hoping to make this polished and live um, probably uh, sometime this weekend, potentially do a release, I'm not sure. Uh, I can't promise anything, but if anyone's interested in trying out the data-driven testing, I can give, definitely give out uh, production builds of what I have on my local machine, and you can test it out and give some feedback, and we can work on making it better. Um, and then plugin demo number two. Um, so I work at a company um, called Apple Tools. I'm sure most of you have heard of them, um, but um, they pay me full time to work on Selenium IDE, and uh, and I think that's so amazing. And a lot of people say, well, why would, why would a company like Apple Tools pay two full-time developers to work on Selenium IDE, that thing that was supposed to be dead? Um, and they, uh, it's because um, they see an opportunity to not only give back to the community, but also to do an integration with Selenium IDE uh, to their offering. And so um, this is, um, so I showed you one, the, the one I just open sourced, and then this is the second plugin that exists in the world <laughs> for Selenium IDE right now. And um, this is something that's um, being, I believe, launched next week. Um, but I want to show this to you now. Um, so let me just create a really simple test, you know, similar to this last example, Google search. But this time, instead of um, doing an assertion by text, I want to add a visual check. And so with the I Apple Tools Eyes extension, I can check a specific element, um, or I can check the entire viewport, the entire page. And what this will do is just a visual check against uh, make, checking for uh, visual anomalies in the layout. And so before I do that, I want to use our amazing new visual grid um, because I want to run it on a bunch of different browser uh, and viewport sizes. Um, and oh, you know what? Device emulation, why not? Let's throw that in there. Um, and some orientations. And the thing that's really powerful about this is that I'm going to run this test once and it's going to take less than a minute to run, and it's going to run on all of those combinations I just specified um, and give visual renderings of all of them. And this is all happening from one execution in Selenium IDE and, um, and then giving you the results. And so once it finishes, I'll show you quickly what that means. This is, yeah, there we go. And so you come here and you can see all of the different combinations I just specified, and then it found some visual anomalies. Um, scroll up, Dave. Um, and so you can compare against the baseline. You can kind of see there's a little bit of a difference, but we have this thing called root cause analysis that can actually inspect the markup from the page. Um, you just have to pick which, uh, which part of the page you want to actually compare against. And then it points out which bits have changed. And so in this case, it looks like the line height was changed and a couple of other things. So without having to actually like go and look at 
the app, try to get it the same state, you have all of it uh, in one, one easy to use place. So, so that's, those are two examples. Um, uh, something you can do to just make the experience better and give something new that didn't exist before um, within the IDE, and then what you can possibly accomplish through vendor integrations. And I'm hoping that we get more companies involved in doing vendor integrations to this caliber. So. Um, like I said, it hasn't been it hasn't been made available yet, but just follow the Apple Tools Twitter account, and um, once it goes live next week, then you'll be able to to have access to it and give it a try if you want. Um, so, regardless of your place um, uh, within test automation, your maturity level, like you're saying, well, Dave, I already have a mature implementation and code using Selenium. Why do I care about Selenium IDE? Um, I think there's something for everybody, regardless of where you're at. Um, and so for the just getting started crowd, um, it's really simple. You author tests, and then you run them in parallel cross-browser on CI. If someone had told me there was a tool like this when I first got started with test automation, I would have been blown away. It would be so amazing. Like, there's, you're done. There's no problems to solve. Um, and then um, if you're already either just you're on your way or you're really far along in test automation, there's a bunch of stuff you can use the IDE for. Um, you can bootstrap manual and exploratory testing efforts. You can use it to take care of uh, routine, mundane setup actions that you don't have an API for. Um, all the setup stuff, there's so many things that you can do to, to really speed up your workflows. Um, and then if you have a mature uh, code implementation, making it so people can author scripts, export it to code, and then put it into your existing uh, your code infrastructure. This is one of the hallmark features of the legacy IDE. It's one that we currently don't have because we're effectively rewriting each part of the IDE. But code export is the next big thing that we're working on right now. And so we're hoping to have that launched um, sometime soon. And then one nice thing, regardless of where you are um, with test automation, I think that you can record a failing uh, test for a defect. You can take and create a Selenium IDE project demonstrates the failure, and then upload it to your team's ticket track, uh, ticketing system. And the best part about it is, since it's a, a browser extension, assuming that the test can be run from someone else's machine, you know, like the, assuming that everyone has the same access to the same environment, they just have to install Selenium IDE and get that project file, and then they can run and, and see the failing test for themselves. So you create a reproducible test case. I think that's pretty, pretty powerful. Um, and um, Selenium IDE is free and open source. Uh, we're the only uh, solution that's both free and open source that's recorded in playback uh, that's this good. <laughs> so uh, I'm biased, but considering I work full time on it. But no one else offers command line execution uh, in parallel cross browser. Uh, all the features that we offer, like there's people who boast that they have code export, but we have all these other things, and we're going to have code export. So um, uh, but it's open source, so if there's anything uh, that you want to contribute, please do do take a look and, and let us know. I think that in open source, even filing an issue is an open source contribution. So even if it's as simple as, hey, I found a bug, or hey, I found a typo in your documentation, like all of that, please, uh, we welcome everything. Um, and so some closing thoughts. Um, I think that the top 10 list that Angie Jones wrote about is really great, um, but the things I, th I care about for um, for something that's a robust, uh, not only record and playback tool, is that the tests have to be reliable and maintainable. Um, you need to have a powerful uh, IDE and have the ability to run them not just quickly, but cross-browser and have really good feedback. And then something that's extendable, which we absolutely have with plugins. Um, I think there's such immense potential for what plugins can offer. Um, and I think that there's something for everybody. And, um, and since we're, it's free and open source, um, I think that anyone can use it and help make it better. So. Um, so I want to say thanks, um, and um, just closing thoughts, um, do check out the website where our docs are, how to get the extension, and then um, Selenium Conf London was recently announced, so do check out this link if you're interested in submitting a talk uh, or making the trek to London. They have a scholarship scheme um, that enables people who might not otherwise be able to afford to go to apply for a scholarship to get some assistance, um, so do check that out, and uh, thank you. Are there any questions? Do, how much time do we have? Okay, five, five, ten minutes. All right. Question: Do we have a microphone for him? Or
do I know any information about Catalan Recorder? Yeah. Yeah, so, so this is a question we get a lot, and it's basically, what's the difference between Selenium IDE and other tools like Catalan Recorder or Contu um, or Testim? Um, I mean, you could throw commercial tools in the list as well, but free tools, basically. And why would you choose Selenium IDE over the others? Um, and that's a great question. Um, so if you, it depends on how you want to look at it. So Catalan uh, has a lot of feature parity with what we offer, and they have things that we don't. Um, and it, basically, everything that existed in the legacy Selenium IDE, they effectively just ported it over uh, and then added some additional niceties to it. Um, we are effectively rewriting the IDE um, and making it robust. And we're taking all the bits that were good about the IDE and leaving everything else behind and making it better. Um, so that's, that's one piece. So anything that we don't currently have, um, and the biggest lacking feature is code export. They have code export, we don't. And I think that's the biggest place where we lose users. But we'll have code export. And it will be way better than what they have for code export when we land it. Um, also, they're free, but they're not open source. And that's, I think, common distinction people don't get right. They don't, they don't know that. They're just like, oh, it's free. I think it's open source. But it's, it's a vendor that has done this tool, made it free, uh, but closed source with an integration to their commercial offering. Um, whereas Selenium IDE, is free and open source, part of the Selenium project, uh, licensed under Apache, will always be free. Um, and so a vendor could decide to close their doors, and like, then what are you going to do? <laughs> and so um, so uh, the things we've decided to pay attention to, aside from the rewrites, is really focusing on good stability, good quality. And getting record and playback right is so hard, because there's so many edge cases. So um, we constantly compare just not even not just like features that people want, but like it's something as simple as the Google test. Like, can can other tools go to Google, type in type in you know whatever and hit enter, and that that simple test is very difficult to get right, and a lot of tools don't always get that right. So we care a lot about the record and the playback, getting that really dialed in, and getting the features that we do have really polished, and then adding more features with that same care. And so it's unfortunate in that. People need these features now, <laughs> and we don't have them, but we will have them soon. Um, and in that, in that sense, um, once we have them, there's really no, there's no comparison, I think. Question over here, one sec. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question, uh, since you mentioned that it's really critical to provide uh, good, reliable locators, does the Selenium IDE take into account or trying to guess what framework is it? Is it like Vue.js, Angular? Because, for example, if it's Angular, it may be a bit tricky to work with the drop downs. Is there any something right now or in the roadmap? That's a great question. Um, so, right now, we don't have um, anything that's explicit to the type of underlying framework that's built, although it's Angular is the quintessential example because you can very easily discern if it's an Angular app based on its locators. That's not true of all, um, all frameworks, unfortunately. So what we try to do is have a more general heuristic of identifying when something is tricky, not necessarily that it's explicitly that framework. It's just trying to create a more universal solution that accounts for edge cases. So we have like the happy path, and then there's the, oh, that didn't quite work. We have a fallback, and then we have a best effort after that. So we're trying to build something that's kind of a one-size-fits-all and not try to hard code it specifically to, ah, this is Angular, so you got to do this. Um, it's more like there has to be some other, has to be some other indicator that we can look at, that we can, we can use to say, ah, this dropdown is tricky. It might be tricky in Angular. It could also be tricky in you know, some other web app that's built in some horrendous way. <laughs> so we want to make sure that we can account for that trickiness regardless of, of the underlying framework. So, um, but the locators, the recording infrastructure in Selenium IDE is, um, is a lot of legacy code that we're slowly cleaning up and adding better coverage and trying to improve. Um, and, and the locator strategies as, as they're recorded is also in that same boat. So we're always looking for ways to improve it. Um, so um, if, if you use the tool uh, on an Angular app and for some reason you're like, this, is, this is, it seems like a bug, uh, let us know, because we'd love to have more specific use cases where the tool falls down. Um, 
what we don't want is people who use the tool and say, ah, this is garbage. And then they go to like the Mozilla add-on store and they give us a one-star review without any feedback. We're like, we can't help that person. We don't even know what was wrong for them. So before you do the one-star review, at least um, either type in a comment or go to the, but even better, open a GitHub issue and let us know because we, we really want to make this, this work for everybody. So we have time for one more or are we? Okay, we have time for one more question, maybe two. Okay, uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, how does this tool handle uh, iframes? Like, for example, have different iframes you would need to switch between them to find elements, stuff like that. And uh, another question regarding parallel execution uh, in the example that you demonstrated. Uh, how do you kind of take screenshots or debug or failing tests? Like, for example, you have alert, uh, browser alert, and you can't even take snap, a snapshot, for example, and stuff like that. So um, how do you interact with things that are traditionally things you have to switch to? Uh, it sounds like the general gist. Um, so with recording specifically, um, we, we handle a lot of this for you. Um, so the commands that get populated are effectively the switch to commands. Um, iframes are really annoying. <laughs> uh, so we have trouble sometimes with cross-origin iframes. And so right now, the only way we can interact with frames in the IDE is through index. Like when the page is generated, there's a hierarchy of all of the frames. And we, we, find we, and we also add an iframe to the page. Because in, in the new IDE, there's a recording indicator. Um, and it to let you know which, which tab is active and where you're recording. And um, so that also changes the index. And so there's all this hoop jumping we have to try to get the locator right to make sure we're like not off by one. <laughs> and so, and then you throw cross origin into the mix and like you can't easily, this is why we can't use locators right now because we don't have a good way to like effectively use locators to target cross origin iframes. Um, but regardless of that, index is good enough and we have a pretty good enough way to make sure we have the correct iframe. And so when you're recording and you click into a frame, even if it's a nested frame, it should you know, follow the proper level of inception down to where you are. Um, so if you're interacting with that kind of stuff, even and also the same thing goes for um, pop-ups and interacting with them. We do all the, we take care of all of that because we can, we can track the events as the browser fires them and then add the correct commands to interact with it and play back in the correct order. If you're trying to add those commands manually in the IDE, um, it's harder because you have to know what all of them are. Um, and uh, as opposed to like in code, it's just like, oh, switch to, do this, do that, and you're done. But since there's more events and there's more constraints, given that we're in browser playback using synthetic events, like there's more things we have to do. Um, but we just do them for you, and it just adds a little bit more verbosity to your test, but it's just there, it's just taken care of. Um, then when it comes to if you're trying to take snapshots, um, you just have to know, um, you have to kind of be aware of when these alerts pop up, uh, or um, potentially looking into a way to, if they're uh, completely random <laughs> when they pop up, then that's a whole different problem to solve. Um, and right now we don't have, um, we don't have like an auto dismissal functionality, but that could potentially be something that we look into, like some flag that you toggle where it's like, oh, just always dismiss these, these things as they come up, um, if that's, you know, if that's your jam. <laughs> but, um, but then you just have to be aware when you're taking snapshots to make sure that you're actually in the pages in the correct state and you're focused on the correct window. Um, but if you record it that way, um, odds are pretty good that when you, when it gets to the time during playback, that it's going to take a snapshot. It'll, it'll take the correct snapshot. Um, cause we've added more explicit commands for switching windows and how we do window handling to make sure that there's consistency between both when you record and, um, when you record in the IDE and when you play it back in the command line runner. And so the biggest one most recently was, um, switching between windows, not even just like what you've mentioned, iframes and JavaScript alerts, switching windows. Um, window handles across browser, it's like it's not specced in a sane way. And so each browser handles it differently. Um, sometimes they're random order, uh, they're not alphabetical, you, you get a mixed bag. And so we had to make the conscious decision to when we record an action that opens a new window and switches to it, we have to actually give a targeted name for that window handle and explicitly store that, and then use that when we play back in the command line runner using WebDriver. 
Otherwise, we'd have no way to accurately, consistently switch between windows. Um, and so as far as debugging is concerned, it's a little trickier once you get parallel and you run in the runner. Um, so really, it's like get it right in, in the browser uh, with playback in the IDE. And then it should run the same in the runner. Um, and then if it doesn't, um, then then that's potentially a, a, a bug. It's either an issue in the application under test, or it's a bug in how in the disparity between playback and web uh, playback in the runner and playback in the browser. And that's a known issue we're accounting for right now. When we do playback in the browser, it's like it's a very big question you asked. Um, uh, <laughs> when, right now, when you do playback in the in the browser, it's not using WebDriver. We have our own synthetic um, playback loop that we've created, and we're, we're using synthetic events and untrusted events to to just basically. Uh, we're in. We're all up in injecting JavaScript into the page, like and and driving the browser. We're moving away from that. We're moving to uh, WebDriver playback uh, in the browser, but that's not for some time. But we'll get there. So eventually, there'll be no discrepancies between using the runner and using using the in browser. So thanks for the question. Next slide. Uh, sorry, all other questions you can ask on Coffee Point.